is set chronologically after the Exodus, after they came out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, went into the Sinai wilderness there. Uh, They were kind of out there for about a year and a half, and then they camped in front of Mount Sinai for a, a time where God was giving the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, and then uh, we're at the point in the book of Numbers where it's about time for them to head out from Mount Sinai and to go take the land. And so God is, uh, in this first uh, couple of chapters, he's preparing them to be a mobile unit heading out on this journey. Um, the graphic that I have up here is, is kind of a depiction of being stranded in the wilderness because, as you know, the children of Israel rebelled against the Lord. They got out there. God said, go into the land. And they got up to Canaan and saw the giants in the land. And they said, man, we are not going in there. They're too big. They'll squash us like bugs. We're not going in there. And they rebelled against the Lord. They did not trust the Lord. And as a result, that generation that rebelled against him ended up wandering around endlessly in that desert for 40 years until they all died. And so that's the idea uh, some of the graphics I have are just kind of gloom and doom. But it's the, it's the tragedy of a life that is disobedient to the Lord. It's the tragedy of a life that rebels against what God has for us. You know, we want to uh, take what God has for us and, and just be obedient to that and, and walk in that. And when we don't, our lives are a disaster. And we end up, much of our lives, much of our adult lives, just going through a wilderness experience And so we don't want to do that. And so there are very many uh, important lessons for us to learn here in the book of Numbers. You know, uh, most churches won't ever, ever (laughs) cover Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy because they just think there's no relevance there for us in the 21st century. But man, it's all over the place. I mean, where we are as as a body of believers right now, it couldn't be any more relevant. I mean, here we are, Uh, And you're going to think tonight that I'm making all this up and that I'm trying to make it fit uh, with where we are. Uh, But tonight, uh, God's going to tell them, I want this group of people to do this job and this group of people to do this job and you've got to assign tasks for people and and we're going to be packing up the tent and packing up the curtains and packing up this stuff and these guys are going to do this and these guys are, you know, and, and it just really started making me think about where we are as a, as a body of believers right here in Calvary Chapel Eureka. We're about ready to pack up this church and take it down to Wabash and, and embark on this, you know, monumental task that God is giving us to evangelize Eureka, California, and to reach out to those people down there in the most crime-ridden part of town and to touch broken lives. And, you know, we need to be equipped. We need to be ready for that. We need to be prepared for that. And that's what these two chapters are going to talk about tonight. The work of the ministry. Assign tasks. People, God is going to say, these people are going to do this. He's giving them those gifts. He's giving them those callings. And and so it's just amazing to me that uh, God meets us where we're at. If we're faithful to study his word, he he will meet us right there and show us the things that we need to know. Um, looking at this particular passage, it reminded me of, you know, just packing up a military unit. As we go through this, you'll see, uh, you know, just being a mobile unit. Uh, The Navy, we are very good in aviation in the Navy of taking all of our stuff and putting it on an aircraft carrier, going to sea for six months, and then taking it all back out and, and putting it back in a squadron hangar somewhere. But my last tour in the Navy, we... The Navy's doing a new thing now where the Mar- one Marine Corps squadron is going onto the carrier and doing that, and then a Navy squadron is coming off the carrier and going to Marine bases and doing this type of deployment, which is totally different for the Navy. Packing all of our stuff into a C-5 and, and flying over to Japan or Korea and uh, spending a couple weeks there and then packing it back up and, and going over somewhere else and just hopping all over the place in a very mobile... And, and so as we began to look into this, there were so many things that we had no clue about. It was all different for us. And we had to train individuals 
to know how to load those planes and the weight and balance and all the different things. You know, we had to learn uh, a, a totally different way of doing things. And that's where the children of Israel are right here. Uh, this is a totally new thing for them. They're going to be packing up all this stuff that God has told them to build, the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the uh, showbread table, and the, the lampstands, and who's going to do what, who's going to be assigned what task. And, and it's, so it's very interesting as we look at this here tonight. Uh, Ephesians, Paul tells us in chapter 4, verse 11, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then it goes on to say, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Every part of the body of Christ has a a calling, has a gift, has something that they can contribute to the whole so that the body will be built up. And that is what God is going to detail down to the Levites and to the children of Israel. He's going to count them. These are the men of war. There's so many in this group. There's so many in this group. We covered that last week. But now we're specifically looking at the children of Levi, the descendants of Levi, who will run the priesthood. They will be doing the work of the ministry, that, that very, very important work of, of running the tabernacle and running the priesthood. It's, it's just a very logical thing, you know, just um, everyday things that need to happen when you're talking about packing things up. And so um, routine, there you go. Sure, we'll use that word. So anyway, um, and here in the body, you know, I, we've been down there at that, that old building on Wabash. And I know I talk about it a lot, but my life is consumed with it. So um, let's just admit it. Uh, you know, here we're, we're doing some landscaping out there, you know, and things are starting to look good. Things are starting to look taken care of. And, and, but still, every night, you know, the drunks come down there and they pass out on the steps and they break their bottles of liquor and they throw their beer cans down and and then they throw a shopping cart onto the lawn and and then they spray paint the walls or whoever somebody's spray painting the walls you know and i i just look at that stuff and you know we've done all this work and but it's still there's there's these little things that are going to keep on happening and so you know i'm just thinking oh man we're gonna have to pick this stuff up every day we're gonna have to do this every day and all these new tasks that we just haven't been used to doing around here you know, this place is pretty much set up. We come in, we, we have church, and we go home. Um, but there's so many things that need to be done down there. And so this morning we were just praying about, you know, people just kind of finding their, finding their place in the body here and just doing very simple routine things, straightening the chairs, you know. I, I, we're just praying for somebody to, man, my job is to straighten chairs. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do it faithfully. And nobody's going to tell me to do it. I'm just going to do it. And little things like that, you know, just go so far in just the, the day-to-day operations of a church. And so, anyway, as we get into this, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Chapter 3, the sons of Aaron, if you follow along with me in verse 1. Now, these are the records of Aaron and Moses when the Lord spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priests, whom he consecrated to minister as priests. Nadab and Abihu had died before the Lord when they offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. So Eleazar and Ithamar Uh, ministered as priests in the presence of Aaron, their father. And so you you might remember, uh, if you were here for the Leviticus study or just going through there, again, we see this tragedy of unbelief, this tragedy of being disobedient to God's word. Aaron's sons were placed in the position of being priests. And what had God told them to do? He, He told them how to to offer things on the fire, what not to do, how to cleanse themselves before they offered things on the fire. But we find, if you go ahead and flip back there, I I think it's worth us just taking a a real quick peek there in in Leviticus chapter 10. There's not a whole lot said about it other than what actually happens here. So we don't know exactly what these two guys did. 
But it says in verse 1 of chapter 10 in Leviticus, one book back to the left, in case you were wondering, uh, then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. And so again, we don't know when exactly this happened after the law was given, after the priesthood had been established. Um, At some point in there, God had told them what to do, how to do it very specifically, and they were disobedient to that. We get somewhat of a a clue, if you continue on in verse 8, after the mourning process began and, and the Lord said, you know, don't mourn for these guys, just move on and be obedient to the Lord. Don't blaspheme the Lord. It says in verse 8 there, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes with the, which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. And so there's an indication there, perhaps they were in there drinking while they were supposed to be uh, offering the sacrifices. We don't know for sure, but that's certainly a possibility. But the, the, the main point is here, look, you're the priest. You're supposed to be showing the people, being an example to the people, showing them how they should live their lives, how they should carry on, how the sacrifices should be given, and, um, and you must know what's, what's unholy and what's holy, what's clean, what's unclean. And evidently, they did something that uh, totally blew that out. And so what a tragedy. Aaron's sons, you know, here they're embarking on this journey, uh, serving the Lord, and he loses his two sons right off the bat, right from the very get-go. And so God established a, a very strong um, example there. You know, don't take this lightly. This is very serious. The worship of the Lord, serving the Lord, it should be taken very seriously. It should not be played with. And so uh, returning back to our passage there, uh, in verse 5 it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may serve him, and they shall attend to his needs and to the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting to do the work of the tabernacle. Also, they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. And of course, that's where I took the title from tonight, the work of the ministry, the work of that tabernacle. The people... um, of Israel needed to have their sins covered. And and it was very important that the the priesthood was doing exactly what God had told them to do with that tabernacle. Offer the sacrifices in the right way um, and command the people to do it in the right way so that the sins of the people were were not held against them and that the Lord now, uh, you know, had communion with them. And there was nothing standing between the Lord and the people. And so the priests, the high priest and and the sons of Aaron are only a few people. They can only do so much. They can't go out and and take care of everything. They needed these other uh, children of Levi to help them in that. And really, it's the same way here. As, as you fast forward thousands of years to the, to the ministry that we're all a part of here at Calvary Chapel Eureka. Um, we need to uh, be about just <clears throat> um, meeting the needs of the people, meeting the needs of the people in the congregation, serving the Lord in such a way that people's needs are met. And not just to be a seeker-friendly, okay, you know, what are the needs? Let's, let's just meet their needs and make them happy so they come to our church and we grow a big church. No, it's, it's not that. You know, the worship ministry, you know, people have a need to worship God in spirit and in truth. That is a, is a must. And so we must provide that. We must uh, have a ministry that is, is vital 
and very important uh, that people can come and just be able to enter into a deep, meaningful, relevant uh, worship of the Lord that's done in spirit and in truth. And so, uh, and, and in so many other ways, the teaching of the word, the children, uh, the children need to be cared for. The children need to be rooted and grounded in their faith. They need to be shown the love of God. Perhaps many of them don't have fathers and mothers that love them. And certainly we're going to encounter that down there it, once we get down into the Wabash building. Uh, we've encountered that down there already. You know, children coming in and they're just kids from the neighborhood. Uh, you know, you can just tell by looking at their faces that they don't know what it means to have a loving father. They don't know what it means to have a, a mother who cares about them and who will take care of them and change their clothes and take, give them a bath and any of that, any of that kind of stuff that, you know, most of us are very familiar with. And so, um, you know, there are so many needs out there. I can't do them all. You know, the elders that are here, the deacons, the, the people in leadership are not able to meet all those needs. Uh, and so there is a call for, you know, we are all in the priesthood. We are kings and priests in the service of the Lord. And so I, I think that's a call for all of us, not just the people who feel called to be a pastor or a worship leader, um, but for all of us to find out, man, God, what do you want me to be doing? How can I serve? How can I help uh, meet the needs of people? How can I help, um, you know, in this way, in some, in some fashion? <clears throat> I've got a verse here from Acts. You remember um, in the beginning of the church, the 12 apostles were trying to do everything. They were trying to meet the needs of the people and, and preach the gospel and go out and evangelize. And they were trying to do all these things. And they just got to the point where they said, okay, we can't do this anymore. And so what did they do? They, they got the, the guys together there and they said, look, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. There were women that were not being fed. They were not being taken care of. Their daily needs were not being met. And so the 12 apostles got together and they said, look, uh, brethren, Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so there is that, um, it's not really a distinction, but uh, I mean, there needs to be some priorities set. Um, you know, certainly in the position that I'm in, I, I feel I want to meet people's needs. I, I want to feed people and help people and, and meet people's needs. But I also know I've got to be studying the word. You know, it, it's funny. A lot of times, um, because I work a full-time job, I'm preparing a sermon right up until the last minute many times. I mean, Sunday morning, I'm up at five and just kind of reviewing and making sure I've got all my notes together. And and very often, uh, two hours three hours, maybe one hour before a service, the phone will ring and somebody says, hey, I, I want to come to your church today, but I don't have a ride. Can you, can you give me a ride? And so, you know, I put in the, I put in the bulletin here this uh, faithful servants quarters thing and I put on there rides ministry for that reason because I'm often put in the position of Okay, well, I can stop studying the word here um, and, and try to call some people and, and try to find somebody to give you a ride. I can't do it because I'm, I'm still in the middle of it. You know, but, you know, those are the kind of ministries that we need, and we're going to need more and more of that as we strike out into this community. If we want to affect the people's lives out there, we, we just have to have these kind of ministries up and running before we get down there. Same thing here. Before we get to the land of Canaan, before we head out, we need to have these things kind of set up and ready to go. And, uh, and people need to know what their tasks are. That's why we're doing the thing on Friday morning down at the uh, church, uh, the equipping thing. I think uh, we're calling it Find Your Place on the Wall. You know, it's not, it's not a coincidence that we're doing that study down there, that now we're, we're talking about this here tonight. I, I mean... It's just God preparing us. I really sense that God is preparing us for a work that he wants to do here in Eureka. And so, um, you know, going back to that rides ministry. Well, <laughs> sorry, I can't get you a ride today. I mean, sometimes I have told people I just can't, I can't get you a ride today. 
So um, I'm not saying this to put a guilt trip on anybody. Um, okay, maybe a little. No, uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, those are the kind of things we need to have those ministries in place. And so, you know, I, I just ask you to pray about. I mean, this is the Wednesday night crowd. I mean, this is the faithful few who come out on a Wednesday night. So, you know, I, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, you know, you guys need to pray about these ministries here. These are ministries that we need to fill. And, and we've had some people check these off and turn them in, but not enough. We haven't had enough of those turned in. So be praying about that stuff. If there are other ministries that you see us failing at, and I'm sure there are many, bring it up. Write it on there. Just, hey, what about this ministry? I'd like to do this. Man, I, I'm all for it. How much money do you need? How many people do you need to help you? Let's do it. Yeah, it sounds great. Um, anyway. Continuing on there. Attend to the needs and the needs of the whole congregation. You remember that uh, a little little ways down the road here, the first battle will happen. And uh, Moses, when he's out there and his arms are in the air, that battle's going well. But when his arms start getting tired and they start falling, they start losing the battle. And so the guys came over and helped him hold his arms up. And so that's what we need here. We need some folks supporting, holding arms up. And uh, together, knit together, every part supplying what what God has given you the ability to supply is how a body of believers makes an impact in their community. That's just how it works. And so um, God wants everybody to be involved. Um, If you're in a position in your life right now where you just need to be fed, I totally understand that. Um, I've been there myself. You know, I'm going to go to this church I'm not going to serve. I need to get fed. I need to heal. I need to, you know, I understand that. And if that's where you're at, that's good. Um, But don't stay there forever. (laughs) You know, you can get into a, wow, this is pretty comfortable. I think I'm just going to do this for a while. More healing is needed. I'm sure of that. Uh, You know, heal up and then get back in the game. You know, that's where God wants you. Heal up and get back in the game. Get back in the battle. We are in a battle. So, Look at it in those terms. All right, well, let's move ahead here. (laughs) All right, so in verse 9, And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons, and they, uh, let's see, they are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, indeed, instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck the, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. And so you remember that when God brought the people, the children out of Israel, you remember that there was a, a day that, you know, the final plague on Egypt was that their firstborn uh, male would die in all the land. And so as part of that, God saving all the firstborn of Israel, he said, they're going to be mine. You know, I'm going to save them. I've ransomed them. And so they're going to be mine, not in the sense that he was going to kill them or sacrifice them, but that their lives would now be dedicated to the work of, of, of the ministry, the, uh, you know, just serving the Lord. And so now God is, now that he has set up the Levitical priesthood, he's changing that a little bit and saying, okay, I I wanted the firstborn of the land, but now I'm going to take the Levites, the firstborn of the Levites. So that's what he's saying here as he details that out. Um, And it gives you the idea that, you know, we are also redeemed uh, by the Lord. You know, that angel of death has passed by us because the blood of Jesus was found on our lives. And we have been redeemed. We have been bought at a price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Uh, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
we were bought at a price. Our lives don't belong to us anymore. God ransomed us. He snatched us out of the fire. He saved us. And now he says, I want you to live your life for me. Not in the sense that, um, you know, of course, we're not going to be killed uh, in a sacrifice situation, but we are now living sacrifices. We are to offer our lives as a living sacrifice for the Lord. Our bodies, our lives, you know, we, we want to live our lives the way we want to live our lives. But uh, when you say that Jesus is my Savior and Lord, you're, you're putting yourself in a category of being a bond slave, a, a servant. Now, I'm going to live my life for him. And, uh, and whatever he says goes. And so that's the idea. <clears throat> and so uh, he's saying now that I'm going to take the Levites, and the Levites are going to be dedicated to taking care of this priesthood here. And so now, because of that, he wants to do a census. You remember last week, and uh, we looked at the numbering, counting all the soldiers in all the tribes. And that's why we call this the book of Numbers, because there are many numberings. There are many times where they go through and number, okay, these are all the tribes, these are all the Levites, and, and that goes on throughout the book. So we're not going to get into that too much. We'll skip over that like we did last week. But basically... Uh, the first two verses here, uh, verse 14. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the children of Levi by their father's houses, by their families. You shall number every male from a month old and above. Remember last week, the numbering of the tribes were from 20 years old and above. Those who were able to go to war. But now we're looking at children coming out of the Exodus, one month old and above, who can serve the Lord. And that's the way they're going to count it. Uh, So Moses numbered, verse 16, them according to the word of the Lord as he was commanded. These were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Merari, however you say that. And uh, and so that's as far as I'm going to read on that because it's just going to go through there now and say these are the names of their sons and their sons and their sons and and here's what they're going to do in the in the packing up and moving of the tabernacle. Um, <clears throat> they're going to camp in verse 23. It says that they're going to camp behind the tabernacle westward, and in verse 25, at the end of verse 25, it says that uh, Gershon in the tabernacle meeting, including the tabernacle, these are the things that they're, their duties, verse 25, the duties of the children of Gershon in the tabernacle meeting included the tabernacle, the tent with its covering, the screen for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the screen for the door of the court, the hangings of the court, which are around the tabernacle and the altar and their cords according to the, all the work relating to them. Now, <clears throat> When we were going through the book of Leviticus and a little bit in Exodus, we talked a lot about this. And so I don't want to go over and rehash that stuff again. If you want to check it out, you can go online and and check it out in Leviticus. But you remember that the court, the outer court of the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, just many, many um, different tent um, coverings, badger skins, different types of cloths for different parts of the tabernacle, different cords and uh, tent pegs and poles and all, all this stuff that God told them step by step to, by step to build, uh, just, you know, overlaid with gold. This one's going to be silver. This one's going to be bronze. All that stuff now is going to have to be packed up and moved. And so now he's just saying who's going to do what. And, and so that's as far as we'll go into that. Um, as you keep going there, it talks about now the, the family of Kohath. What, is, what are their responsibilities in verse 31? Their duty included the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, the utensils of the sanctuary. And so the first guys, Gershon, they have the tents and the, and the coverings. And now these guys, are, they have the, the furniture inside the tabernacle itself. And this is interesting because, uh, and, and actually we're going to talk about it in chapter 4, so I don't want to get into it. But then uh, talking about the third guy there, Merari, uh, in verse 36, it says it included the boards of the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, its utensils, all the work relating to them and the pillars of the court, 
all around their sockets, their pegs, and their cords. So kind of the structure of the tabernacle, the poles that held up the tents and, and the sockets and all the things that held the tents together, um, <clears throat> the hardware, you might say. And so <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. <laughs> All right, so that's what all that is about. In verse 30, uh, let's go with 38. Moreover, those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east, before the tabernacle of meeting, were Moses, Aaron, and his sons, keeping charge of the sanctuary to meet the needs of the children of Israel. But the outsider who came near was to be put to death. And so it's just saying that nobody else but the children of Levi could come in and work with the stuff inside the tabernacle because they were unclean. They, were not, they hadn't gone through the process of being sanctified and, and God said, they're not coming in here. If they try to come in, then they're going to be put to death because it was very serious. Verse 39, all who were numbered of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron numbered at the commandment of the Lord by their families, all the males from a month old and above were 22,000. That's a, an important number to remember there. We're going to look at that here in a minute. Um, and then in verse 40, uh, we're, going to, we're going to summarize a little bit of this here. The Levites are going to be dedicated to a lifetime of service. Again, they were ransomed. They, they were the ones who were going to serve the Lord forever. And, then, uh, and so this, this next part is going to talk about how <clears throat> originally God said, I want all the firstborn of all the tribes. And so that was going to total uh, 22,273. You can see that over in verse 43. Uh, The total number of the firstborn, after they counted all the firstborn of all the tribes, it was was the uh, 22,273. When they totaled all of the, just the children of the Levites, from 30, was it 30 days? Yeah, 30 days old and above, it was 22,000. So there's a difference of 273. And so the rest of the chapter just talks about the fact of how is God going to be paid back because there's a difference of 273 people. And so I I didn't really have much commentary on it, and it's kind of tedious reading. So uh, you can read over that on your own, but basically... What God says is, I want you to take five shekels for each one of those individuals that is missing and, uh, and, and just total that up, and that would be given to uh, the priest there. A lifetime of dedicated service for the Lord is just what I was looking at there. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, uh, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So we are redeemed in that way. We are a special people. God has set us aside for uh, special works that he wants us to be doing, good works. And so that's the idea. That's what's going to That's the dedication of the Levite children. They are special. They're set aside for the work of the Lord and their lives are going to be dedicated to that. All right. Well, let's continue on here. Chapter four, duty calls. And uh, this one goes pretty quick. Talking about the duties of the sons of Kohath first there. Now it's just going to detail, you know, what, what, uh, a little more in depth about what they 'll be doing, but first, a census is going to be taken of each of the sons uh, in verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, "Take a census of the sons of Kohath from among the children of Levi, by their families, by their father 's house, from thirty years old and above, even to fifty years old, all who enter the service to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting." This is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of meeting relating to the most holy things. When the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his sons shall come and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. And so the sons of Kohath, the guys who were going to be packing up the ark of the covenant and the, um, the altar of incense, 
the table of showbread, the, um, the lamp, the, uh, the candlestick, all that stuff, the candelabra. Uh, those guys are going to be dealing with that. But remember, only the high priest can go in to the Holy of Holies one time per year with blood to offer for all the people. So you can't just say, okay, guys, let's pack it up, break it down, let's get going, let's head out, uh, go get the Ark of the Covenant. You know? So what's happening here is, is kind of a situation where they have to take that veil that's in front of the Ark and lay it over. They can't just walk back there and do that. But before we get into that, it's interesting here that 30 years old and above, that's the time where you start ministering. And I, I think that's a, an interesting age. You know, that, that really is about the point where you want to start thinking about putting somebody into ministry. You don't want to necess- necessarily take somebody right out of high school, early 20s. You know, there, there's some things that need to be worked out in people's lives. I mean, I, I'm still pretty wet behind the ears at 41 to be a pastor, I think, personally. But, um, you know, I, I think 30 is a, is a pretty good uh, time frame. And it's interesting because you remember Jesus began his ministry when he was 30. And so when we look into the Old Testament, we start seeing things like that that explain what we see in the New Testament. Oh, Jesus began his ministry at 30 years old because they wouldn't have listened to him otherwise because that's, that's the time where you begin a ministry. They don't even consider you uh, worthy of opening your mouth and saying anything until you get to about that age, and then you're still pretty young. So uh, it's interesting. Another thing about this, it says even to 50 years old. So it's a time of about 30 years or 20 years that they're doing the work of the the ministry there. Um, And so another interesting thing here in John chapter 8, you remember Jesus having this dialogue with the... uh, um, the Pharisees there, the scribes and the Pharisees. And he said, to, he said to them, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Now, what are they thinking? You're older than Abraham? You're, you know, and, then, and then they said back to him. You know, then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? So Jesus is kind of saying, you know, I, I'm a father. You know, and that's what they started looking at, a spiritual father. After you're about 50 years old, you're too old to be in there serving in the ministry. Now you're teaching guys how to serve in the ministry. And so, you know, that's kind of an indication that you're not even 50 years old. You're not even an elder yet. What are you talking about? You, Abraham saw your day. And so, you know, we get little insights into uh, the New Testament when we're going through the Old Testament. I thought I'd just throw that out there. But what an awesome reply that Jesus had to them. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Powerful. You know, I am. Before he was, I am. And of course, he is the eternal one. All right. Well, going back to the veil thing, uh, you can't just go back behind that veil and grab the ark and get a couple guys. Okay, let's get it. Come on, pack it up, put it in the truck. Let's go. Uh, You're not going to do that. You're going to drop dead before you even get behind the veil. So, uh, it kind of seems to indicate here, and it's not detailed out, but it seems that they were told to take down that veil and just walk it back in there, cover the ark up with it, and, and then once it's covered, then they can start doing it. But only the children of Aaron, or the sons of Aaron, and Aaron himself, the high priest, could do that. They didn't let those other guys come in and start moving the stuff until all that stuff was wrapped up, is what this passage is talking about here. They shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Then they shall put on the covering, we're in verse 6, of badger skins and spread over the cloth entirely of blue. And they shall insert the poles. And and so I'm not going to go all the way through there, but it starts talking about the table of showbread. You're going to put a blue cloth on that. Verse 7 there. Um, And then just all the coverings that are going to go on the the candle uh, stand there the showbread table, the, the ark of the, or the um, altar of incense, all that stuff, how it's going to be covered, what it's going to be covered with. Verse 11, on the golden altar, they should spread a blue cloth to cover it, and then badger skins. And so it goes on and on down through there. In verse 15, 
as we come to the end of that. And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them, but they shall not touch any holy thing that, lest they die. So it's very important that they did not mess around with this, that they be very careful about not letting it become uncovered. And you remember later on down the road, David is carrying the ark back to uh, the temple and or back to the, uh, the tabernacle after it had been stolen. And uh, one of the ox kind of stumbles a little bit and the cart kind of moves and the ark starts falling over and a guy reaches out to grab it and, and he dies because he was, he was not clean. He could not touch it. And so very important, very important that they adhere to everything that God has told them serving the Lord and also for us. So in the uh, second part of verse 15 there, these are the things in the tabernacle of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. Uh, the appointed duty of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the, the priest, is the oil for the light, the sweet incense, the daily grain offering, and the, anoint, the anointing oil, the oversight of all the tabernacle, of all that is in it with the sanctuary and its furnishings. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Do not cut off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites. He's just telling them, Make sure these guys don't get killed. When, when you say cut off, it's saying get killed, basically. Make sure the children of the Kohathites, because they're dealing in such a, a dangerous place, make sure they don't die unnecessarily. Make sure they know how serious it is. Make sure they don't get cut off. Uh, and so he's, he's given to give them a, a couple of little important tidbits here to make sure that they don't get killed. But do this in regard to them that they may live and not die when they approach the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint each of them to his, ser- to his service and his task, but they shall not go in to watch while the holy things are being covered, lest they die. So they, God didn't even want them in the room. You know, you're not going to be in there watching them cover the thing with a cloth. You know, just stay out. Stay well clear. We don't want anybody getting killed unnecessarily. When everything's covered up and packed up and ready to go, then we'll bring you guys in. And so that's what's dealing with there. All right. Um, 21 through kind of the rest of the chapter goes through and talks about Gershon, what their family's going to carry, and then the other guy as well, Mariah. Somebody tell me how to pronounce that. Mirari? That's kind of what I was thinking, yeah. Sounds good. Merari. We'll go with Merari. So verse 21 uh, talks about the sons of Gershon, what their assignments were. Uh, Verse 21, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take a census of the sons of Gershon by their father's house, by their families, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old. And and then it goes on through there. And so we're not going to go cover all that, but... If you look in verse 25, they shall carry the curtains of the tabernacle and the tabernacle of meeting with its coverings, the covering of badger skins that is on it, the screen for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the screen for the door of the gate of the court of hangings, and and it just goes on in that fashion. Verse 27, Aaron and his sons shall assign all the service of the sons of the Gershonites, all the tasks and all their service, and you shall appoint to them all their tasks as their duty. You know, this is one of my greatest challenges as as being a pastor, I think, sometimes, is do I assign people things? You know, do I say, okay, hey, you'd be good at this. Why don't you do this? Uh, You know, what I'd love to do is just somebody come up to me and say, man, God has put it on my heart to do this. Let me do it. And, and then it's just a matter of, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I think you'd be good at that. Yeah, I think I can see that. Yeah, do it. You know, whatever you need, let us help you and, and that kind of thing. Um, but sometimes, you know, there is a need, I think, to just talk to folks about it, you know. And so if I ever come to you and ask you, hey, why don't you pray about doing such and such, and such whatever it might be. 
um, please know that if I come to you and say that to you, I've, I've prayed about it and I've thought about it and I've, I've kind of watched you for a little while and I've kind of thought, you know, that would be a good good ministry for them. I think that fits them well. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't try to shotgun people with just, hey, we need somebody to do this over here. Who, who's standing around not doing anything? You know, I mean, I could definitely do that. But um, I, I think it, it is a disservice to you, first of all. Um, you know, I, I don't like to just assign things to people. I like to kind of think about it and pray about it and, and uh, seek the Lord on a little bit, kind of try to match up the, the, uh, the personality and, and, you know, just kind of determine if that's something you might be gifted in. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times the Lord puts it on my heart to just ask somebody to do something. And, and sometimes it fits, sometimes it doesn't. You never know. So it's always, a, it's always a challenge, you know, to try to assign tasks or just have somebody come and volunteer. And, uh, and so anyway, I, I just want to let you guys know that. Again, you're the Wednesday night crowd. Um, you know, if I, if I do come and ask you to pray about doing some type of ministry here in the church, I have thought it through a little bit. I prayed about it usually and uh, thought it might be a good fit for you. So uh, I don't do a good, whole lot of shotgunning. It generally doesn't work. So anyway, uh, it is a challenge though to, to fill the needs and, and just make sure things are being taken care of here. So uh, as it goes into talking about the sons of Moriah there, Merari, uh, verse 31, we'll, we'll start there. And this is what they must carry as their service for the tabernacle of meeting, the boards of the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, excuse me, and the pillars around the court with their sockets, pegs, and cords, and with their furnishings and all their service. And you shall assign to each man by name the items he must carry. This is the service of the families of the sons of Merari and as all their service for the tabernacle of meeting under the authority of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. And so then in verse 34 down through verse 45, it's going to number them how many people are in that uh, tribe. And we're just going to skip through that numbering there uh, in verse 46. And then we'll wrap this up. All who were numbered of the Levites, whom Moses, Aaron, and the leaders of Israel numbered by their families and by their fathers' houses from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, everyone who came to do the work of the service of the work, work of service and the work of bearing burdens in the tabernacle of meeting, those who were numbered were 8,580. Man, can we have that many people serving here? Wow. 8,000 of them. That'd be awesome. Uh, According to the commandment of the Lord, they were numbered by the hand of Moses, each according to his service and according to his task. Thus were they numbered by him as the Lord commanded Moses. And so there you go. Uh, Very relevant for us, I believe, even though it was written so many thousands of years ago in such a different situation. But, you know, still uh, there is... Work to be done. There is a harvest field out here in Eureka, California. There is, there, there's never a shortage of broken lives, as we prayed this morning over at the church. It's always about the workers. It's always about those whose hearts are stirred to go out there and do the work of the ministry. It's never, wow, I, just, I think everybody's saved. That guy, no. No, I think he is saved. No. You know, it's never that. It's never a lack of, of people needing to be saved. It's always us not being willing, being disobedient, being lazy, really, a lot of times. And so um, whatever it is that God has called you to do, I just encourage you to do it with your whole heart. Dive in there. Colossians 3.22, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as uh, men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. It goes on in that passage, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, 
for you serve the Lord Christ. No matter what you're doing, your job, whatever it is, do it unto the Lord. Do it heartily as unto the Lord. Don't try to please men, just please the Lord and you'll do just fine. So that's what I have for you guys tonight. I encourage you to read ahead. That's kind of some of the some of the things that we'll cover. You know, if you do read through them, then it goes a little bit quicker, and I don't have to um, spend as much time on some areas, and I can uh, summarize some of it. And I just do that for you, because I know some of this reading can be a little painful. But uh, there are many many things that we can glean out of these these books. Um, lots of nuggets in there. Things that we need to know. Uh, absolutely, they're absolutely relevant to us. So let's close in prayer. Father, we do thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. Uh, so relevant, even though it's ancient, Lord. Uh, most might think that it just doesn't apply to us, Lord, but we can see that um, you have called us to a life of service. Lord, you've called us to serve you with a, with a heart of rejoicing, a heart of thanksgiving, Lord, for the things that you've done in our lives. Lord, so help us, Lord, as we uh, want to take this city for you, Lord. We know that there are many tasks, there are many duties, there are many responsibilities that need to be met. There are many ministries that need to be filled in with eager um, eager hearts to, to just see people get saved, to see people be discipled in their faith and rooted and grounded in their faith, to see children, Lord, uh, being equipped and... and uh, knowledgeable about your word. And um, Lord, it, it seems like an overwhelming task sometimes, Lord, but we know that you will meet us there, that you will prepare us, Lord, that you will uh, not lead us into the fire and then abandon us there. Father, we want to follow you with our whole hearts, Lord, and we ask that you would just uh, keep us in the center of your will, Lord, that you would lead and guide us that we would not try to do any of these works on our own. We know that, that we cannot work for our salvation. We know that um, doing little busy tasks don't save us, Father, but because you have saved us, because you have ransomed us, because you have rescued us from the fire, Lord, we offer our lives as a living sacrifice.